Good afternoon. My name is Jazine Alders, and I'm covering the research coordinator position at MIRA while Audrey Patox is on maternity leave. First of all, thank you for taking the time to join us. We have a few tips for getting the most out of the seminar today. If you have not already switched your view in Zoom to speaker view, we encourage you to do so. On your Zoom screen in the top right hand corner, you should see an icon. If the wording under the icon says gallery view, click on the icon once and this should change it to speaker view. If for some reason you were not muted upon entry, we ask that you mute yourself to eliminate any background noise or feedback during the presentation. I would also like to alert you to the chat icon at the bottom of the Zoom screen. If a question or comment occurs to you during the presentation portion of the seminar, we ask that you please type a question or comment in the chat box and we'll we will review these during the question and answer portion of the seminar. Please note that this meeting is being recorded. In beginning this seminar, McMaster University recognizes and acknowledges that it is located on the traditional territories of the Mississauga and Haudenosaunee nations and within the lands protected by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Agreement. The McMaster Institute for Research on Aging, or MIRA, has developed a reputation for its ability to facilitate connections between McMaster researchers across all six faculties, thus driving interdisciplinary research. Since MIRA launched in 2016, we have hosted multiple in-person events and exercises to facilitate interdisciplinary connections, as well as connections with national and international partner institutions. Continuing in this tradition, today we will be crossing faculties at McMaster University to discuss polypharmacy and deprescribing, the paradox of prescription medication for older adults. Our first speaker, Dr. D. Mangan, is the David Braley Chair and Professor in Family Medicine at McMaster University. Her interests are rational prescribing, polypharmacy, patient-centered care, and innovative models of primary care. She has wide experience in clinical research and primary care, including pragmatic randomized trials, and is a fellow of the Royal New Zealand College of General Practitioners. Dr. Mangan is a family physician at the McMaster Family Practice and the director of the McMaster University Sentinel and Information Collab Collaboration Practice-Based Research Network. She is also the medical director and co-founder of rxisk.org, a website for consumer information and reporting of drug adverse reactions. Our second speaker, Dr. James Gillette, is an associate professor in health, aging, and society and Associate Dean Graduate Studies and Research in the Faculty of Social Sciences. In his research, James uses qualitative methodologies to gain a more in-depth understanding of the way individuals approach and manage their health and health care. I will now turn the time over to our first speaker, Dr. D. Mangan. Thank you. Thanks, Jacine. Um, and maybe if somebody could let me know, I'm just gonna screen share now, just somebody could let me know that you can see we can see it, but it's not in presenter view. Yeah, yet. no, that's perfect. It won't it won't share in presenter view for some reason. Okay, perfect. So thanks for that. Somebody must have sent you my long bio. I'm really sorry. Um, but thanks for that introduction and um, in this presentation, I think I'm really looking forward to it because it's a nice intersection of of different perspectives on a, a kind of complex problem. Um, and I am um, now. Can you see? Let me just see, I need to hide that, don't I? Yeah. Um, and it, it really is one of the, the paradox that is, paradoxes that is vexing um, medicine, certainly in primary care at the moment, is that how polypharmacy and how good drugs can be bad for your health. So just a um, brief disclosure of things that might um, influence my perspective on this issue. So I do have um, funding from various agencies to research this. So um, obviously it's it's front and centre in terms of my work activity. Um, I don't take fees from um, commercial organisations for anything research or speaking, but I do provide from time to time expert witness reports for legal actions against uh, drug companies, but I don't personally take that money. I um, That's donated to this independent um, consumer information site called risk.org. So we all know that um, the average number of medications in older adults is now large. And in fact, the average number of medicines, if you're over 65, that you're taking is around seven. And people like Anne here will be really familiar to all of you, either known personally in your family or, or in your work. 
But why is this a problem? Surely with the advances of medical science, these are all good drugs. They've all been through a vetting process to get on the market and surely they represent advances in medical science. Surely if you need the pills, you need the pills. So it's, this is a nice metaphor for how good medicines can also be bad. Um, and it's a bit like music. If you play a little Bach, um, some Miles Davis, Leonard Cohen or the Four Tops or maybe the Boss, on their own, they sound good and they make us feel good as well. But when you play them together, they become a cacophony. And this is what it's like for a patient on multiple medicines. As each drug gets added during their life course, drugs that were beneficial when they were started in combination can cause more harm than good. And, but this is a largely invisible pandemic um, within the medical system. Um, here's an uncomfortable fact. Um, in Europe, where we have the best data, more people die of adverse drug effects every year than die of colon cancer or breast cancer or lung cancer. Yet it's the equivalent of, in Europe, um, more than a jumbo jet or two every day crashing and killing everybody on board. In Canada, um, if over one in 10 people on five or more medicines have a drug side effect that needs medical care. If this was an airline, would you fly in it? But patients fly in this airline every day. Um, if this was an airline, the fleet would be grounded until the problem was fixed. But in fact, while we have screening programs in place to um, try and address these high rates of deaths from different cancers, we have no system in place to try and prevent this, this source of morbidity and mortality. When I was a resident last century, the kinds of um, things that seriously affected patients, the kind of adverse drug reactions that would put them in hospital were this list on the left sort of a rare and dramatic things that were responses to individual drugs. But this has shifted as the population that we um, care for has aged and they accumulate multiple chronic conditions. The kinds of, of serious adverse drug reactions that put our patients in hospital look more like the list on the right. They're a lot less visible than those on the left, a lot less obviously related to medications. And they often represent not just a single reaction to a drug, but a cumulative burden of side effects. If one drug has a side effect you know, to a mild degree, if you add three more drugs that also have a, give you a mild um, side effect, cumulatively, that can be quite serious. As well as um, increased mortality, polypharmacy also has a number of other negative associations. For example, falls, drowsiness, reduced cognitive, cognition. So what is driving this paradox of good medicines becoming bad? So this is a well-known analysis by Cynthia Boyd um, from the US of the way that, that guidelines make polypharmacy in inevitable. And that's a paradox because guidelines were designed to deliver the best of medical science, evidence-based medicine. Um, so we were sure that the patient was getting the best care for their condition. But what happens in a person with multiple conditions is if we give, and it doesn't matter which five conditions you choose, the outcome is the same. If we, if we give this woman what she might have at her age, two diseases that really interfere with her activities, her COPD, which interferes with her breathing, and she can't dance, go dancing with her husband the way that she used to like to, and the osteoarthritis that makes it difficult to play with her grandchildren as she'd like to. Then three other conditions that, because I as a good doctor have done measurements um, in her, have told her that she has high blood pressure, uh, diabetes, and osteoporosis. If we apply the single disease guidelines for each of these conditions, this is what happens. She ends up taking 19 doses of 12 different medicines at five times during the day with a ton of other things that she ought to be doing um, with her, her most precious commodity, which is time. But most importantly, 10 different possibilities for significant medicine interactions, either with other medicines she's taking or other diseases. So the paradox here is that 
um, is a crack in the current way, the current system of understanding good medicine. We find ourselves in a predicament where it's perversely possible to provide care that's measurably better in terms of guideline adherence or performance in the, in the management of these diseases, but can be meaningfully worse for individual patients. And as guidelines have tidied up patients into their component diseases, the loss of meaning and context makes it impossible to hear the melodies of the role of medicines in their life and to provide care that enhances it. And it's not a simple matter of highlighting the problem. There's not a physician alive who doesn't know that polypharmacy can create substantial problems. In trials, how, over half of people who have been on these common medicines over on the right um, can have those medicines stopped with no adverse consequences, no return of the indication for which they were started. Yet, as, as physicians, we seem to have lost our clinical courage. And you will see a narrative of fear coming up later in the presentation where I talk about some of the work we've done. Because in the real world, this doesn't happen. The problem has remained for decades and is growing. So like Dorothy here in The Wizard of Oz, who can give the lion back their courage? And here's an example of what happens locally. So this is a, from a study that we did in Hamilton with our music network, which is our, our practice-based research network. So legacy drugs are drugs that are appropriate in, at initiation and when prescribed for an intermediate period, so longer than, in, say, a course of antibiotics. But they're never intended to be a life sentence. But they assume a kind of legacy status when they're not appropriately stopped after that intermediate period. And we chose three potential markers because what we suspected was that, that these legacy drugs weren't being stopped and that was part of the contribution to the, to the problem. We chose one that was for physical symptoms, one for psychological symptoms, and one that was a treatment of, of an asymptomatic risk factor. And this is what we found. So if you get started on an antidepressant or a proton pump inhibitor, you have nearly a, half, um, a one in two chance of that being continued on longer than the recommended indication, which is we used a, a, a duration of at least 15 months, which is pretty generous. It allows for accidental overruns and things. Bisphosphonates was lower, but that probably represents the time period that we had data for that the, we were able to assess because bisphosphonates, the usual recommended period is five to six years. So we, we didn't have a lot longer than five to six years to assess. Um, and it's not just a little bit long that they're prescribed, it's a lot long. So the median for, for the PPIs, which are the um, anti-stomach uh, uh, acid suppressing drugs, and for the antidepressants, um, the median prescription, if they were legacy duration, was five years. So it's a lot longer than recommended. We also find that this is found this is a huge opportunity because um, over 60% of people who are currently receiving these drugs are in this legacy category. Um, and this is important because note, note the rate of PPI prescription um, that you know, a patient with taking multiple medicines can feel fine and be doing fine, but it's, it's the long-term or future potential harms that are important. And this breaking news study that has come out in the last few days that shows that people who um, are infected with COVID who are taking a PPI at the time are um, much more likely to die of COVID than people who aren't. Um, what this shows is not that doctors are bad. Um, it shows that while our system is really good and our narratives are really great to support starting drugs, we have no real systems or narrative for stopping. So this represents a real opportunity. But because the narrative and the expectations of clinicians and patients doesn't include stopping medicines, we, have, we ne really need some outside the box ways of thinking and really a paradigm shift. So what we started in, in, in trying to look at this problem, we started by partnering with, um, with James, who you'll hear from later, and Diana Sherfali and her group um, to do a review of reviews, to assess the contribution that different types of intervention have made or not made to reduce polypharmacy. And overall, we found that while the Interventions produce such small results sometimes in the number of medicines, reducing them, and in some of the patient important outcomes, really they didn't have a huge effect. Um, it's, it was hard to reduce the number of medicines. 
Um, and we also found a number of issues around the methods used, and including in the specific one that we thought was really important was that there was a lack of any description of the theoretical basis or the underpinning of any of these um, approaches to try and address the problem of, of polypharmacy. That it was really a shortcut to thinking that all you had to do was tell people. Um, so what we started to do was to develop some sort of theoretical model for the mechanisms by which the system might um, work to address polypharmacy um, that took account of why it happens in the first place um, and work that's been done by other people and by us to try and tease out the barriers to addressing it among patients and among prescribers. So our aim was to sort of develop a model and start, start to test it and then be able to, to tweak it. And it's based in part on the minimally disruptive medicine and the cumulative complexity models, which aim to get that balance between the um, ability of a patient to benefit from medical care um, and, and the burden of treatment that they're able to tolerate or, or cope with. And we used um, a prevention framework as well called cautionary prevention, which has been developed, rose up in primary care in the last decade or so, and really is looking at preventing the harms of medical treatment. Um, so what we found and others have found in this, in this work is that there are barriers amongst family physicians. And you can see here that narrative of fear um, started to come through. Family physicians are hesitant to engage patients in discussing quality of life and life expectancy issues. Um, the lack, there's a lack of a framework and a guidance for discontinuation. They feel um, like they don't have the skills to do this. They feel really anxious about not following the single disease guidelines because that's how the quality of care is usually measured. Um, they doubt their ability to manage the tapering and discontinuation process. And the volume of evidence that's required to review and identify medications that might be potentially inappropriate is immense and very fragmented. It's very time consuming to look it all up. So um, pharmacists also say there's really no framework for teamwork and communication. They experts in the, in the concrete and quantitative aspects of potentially inappropriate medicines, but there's no platform in Canada for communication between the two. Therapeutic positivism also comes into play here. Um, we're so keen to sell the good of the treatments that we might give, and that reflects our own hope, that sometimes we forget the slightly uncomfortable fact that most people take, taking long-term medicines aren't actually benefiting from them. In order for half of people to benefit from a drug, the number needed to treat for one to benefit must be less than or equal to two. It's a rare drug, if any, even antibiotics don't reach this, reach this threshold. Drugs like statins are at best in the, in the sort of 20s and 30s numbers needed to treat. Com compounding this is a concept called technological brinkmanship, a term that was coined by an ethicist called Te um, Daniel Callahan, where Everybody knows that a point is reached where enough is enough, that the person's is, uh, condition or life expectancy means that the point has been reached um, when treatment is no longer um, um, carrying benefits, it's futile, but no one is ever quite sure when that point is reached. So treatments are just continued and added. So the challenge is countering the therapeutic imperative that runs through medicine without losing hope so we can bring the best of medical care and of medicines to bear on what matters most to individuals. Because our medical system is very much predicated on doing things. A patient comes with a problem and we do something. We order a test, we give a treatment, and we add more and more of these to a patient in their lifetime. And our measures of quality of care are all about the number of times we do something. So we have no framework yet for not doing things or stopping them and no way of valuing that. The barriers that patients find, um, again, there's a little bit of a narrative of fear that runs through here. They'd usually like to take medicines and think of the idea of a drug holiday is a good idea, but they don't initiate conversations because they fear these things, their doctor's response, not being able to restart if they find the medication was helpful, and abandonment by their physician if they discontinue the prescriptions that that particular physician has started. So you can see there's a sort of a conspiracy of, of silence in the conversation. 
And there's also a complex issue or paradox for the, the physician as well, because this same family doctor may be the one who for years had recommended the beneficial effect of the particular drug. So this is very confusing about face for the patient, or the, at least that's what the physician perceived. There's also the fact that medicines mean a lot more to patients than just a chemical. There are symbols of many things in their life, their investment in their health, their competency to manage their own health. We also asked groups of, um, of patients about their, we used, we used a, um, a uh, appreciative inquiry model where we asked them about their experiences or positive experiences about discussion of their preferences and priorities and, and deprescribing. And this is what they found, uh, what they said to us, that discussion that was initiated by their clinicians was rare that their requests for medication discontinuation um, or their observations of the side effects they thought they were having were largely met with a negative response. They felt trapped in a chaotic um, um, communication system between multiple clinicians where they felt they were the proxy communicator between all these specialists and they had to manage the differing views. And they felt powerless and anxious, especially in um, hospital nursing home settings and families felt powerful. Um, powerless and felt anxious for their effect on overall care if they did raise medication issues that they saw. So you can see here that there are cracks in the system from the patient's perspective, both in primary care and in, in fragmentation across the system. And this is the usual response of patients when they want to stop. They do it on their own. And this is the kind of response that they get um, from clinicians. Um, what we did with this um, set of data was we tried to start to make a model um, of what patients said about when deprescribing or those kind of conversations went right for them. And it became um, really apparent that when it worked um, was when the patient's experience of their medicines was valued, when they were considered the expert in what, which effects that individual medicines had on them as an individual person. Um, when the relationship quality was good with their primary care practitioner. And um, uh, when the, from the provider's perspective, when they were perceived to be patient-centered in their uh, approach to medicine. I, I like this paper the most because the journal actually accept, uh, accepted our title. I think this medicine actually killed my wife, which is a quote from one of the patients. So I, I don't want you to look at this at all. I just want you to see how complex this problem is. When we looked at all these barriers, both from the literature and the work that we'd done, it, it's complex. And it's no wonder it's, it's a, a kind of a wicked problem to try and address. It's complex at every level and there are all kinds of, of paradoxes. Um, what we did find was clear was that teamwork was necessary and for our, um, the intervention that we that we. Um, started to draft, we uh, tried to enable a team of the pharmacist, the family physician, and the patient with the, the diff their different expertise all brought to bear um, on a pathway for trying to deal with polypharmacy. And we tried to develop a pathway that was suitable for use as routine primary prevention in family medicine settings. So something that we could do routinely like we do flu shots or pap smears. Um, and this is how it looks. So the first, um, the first person who gets to contribute is the patient, talking about their goals and priorities related to their medicines. And we, this, this developing how to ask those questions came from our, our work with focus groups. Um, the second is a consultation with the pharmacist where that expertise is brought to bear and some initial recommendations are made. And then the family physician reviews this with the patient in a conversation to discuss it that in the context of their knowledge of the patient over time. And so these are brought together in a final pause and monitor plan. And we deliberately called it pause and monitor to address that fear that patients had of not being able to restart if they found it um, that a medication had been helpful. This is really framed as a drug holiday and then a, a reassessment. But what was also clear is that to, to really address medicines and tailor them to the individual, that it was really important to know what made life worth living for them. What were the priorities for them? Because if you look at an electronic health record, is what is striking about it is what is missing. There is lots about diseases and risk factors and measurements, and there's a lot about drugs and treatments. But what's not visible um, is 
the patient priorities and preferences and perspective that there's so much rhetoric about in our talk of person-focused care. So here's a challenge for us, an opportunity. So these wonderful people did a systematic review looking for any kind of tools that had ever been used or any approaches to trying to make these kinds of things visible. And out of, of thousands of, of articles that they looked at, they found one question and one tool that might be suitable for this situation of a patient with multiple morbidity on multiple dr drugs. And so when we back, went back to our patient focus groups um, to say, you know, to see what were the things that were important to them to have made visible in this conversation. These were the kinds of domains of questions that we ended up with. So the things, the functional things they'd like to do, um, the symptoms they most want their treatments to help with, what they don't want, and what they think about their drugs, which means that they'd like to stop the most, which drugs do they love to hate, and which do they value the most, and how much they value drugs that treat current symptoms versus prevention of future illness. So this is just a, a sort of a snapshot of, of the, there are three parts of the taper tool and pathway. The first is all about the patient and their goals. The second is all about the medicines. And this is really where we, that evidence review is drawn together, all of the possible tools that could be helpful in, um, in trying to flag medicines that might be causing problems to stop the clinicians having to go to these multiple evidence sources, which would take, you know, half an hour at minimum. They're all there in one place and you can just click on the tick um, to drill down into the, the evidence. Um, and then this is the shared pathway. We created what essentially is a shared electronic record for pharmacists and for um, the clinicians. And eventually we hope the patients to be able to communicate, communicate as they move through the pathway. However, the next essential step was figuring out, you know, this sounds like a great and bright idea, but would it actually work in practice? We wanted to trial it on, on a large scale, but first of all, we had to see whether it was feasible to do this. Because um, small things, if, you don't, if you're blind to them, can, can trip you up. Um, so we wanted to ask and answer these kind of questions. Would anyone actually be interested, clinician, from the clinician and the pac patient perspective, um, what kind of effort and research work was going to be needed to try and, and assess this over time? Would the assessment tools work as we hoped? And was there a signal of the hoped for effect? So what hasn't been proven in all of these trials is we know the negative associations of polypharmacy that I described, we have no idea the extent to which they're able to be reversed if we reduce the drug numbers. And then what are the glitches in the patient pharmacist and the, and the physician experiences of this system? So um, we got, got um, what, what we'd hoped for, nearly 40 participants with six months follow-up. We found lots of excellent glitches, lots of excellent process points from this for the implementation and, and sort of redesign of things for the main trial. Um, the tools pretty much all performed as we'd hoped. They were well distributed and, and seemed to be sensitive to change. Some of them were just not feasible to administer. Both patients and research assistants lost the will to live when trying to, to add the HUDAS and Pittsburgh sleep scales to the other, other instruments. So we show, showed more, um, found some more discriminatory um, and shorter instruments to use. Um, we looked at the extent to which including patient priorities affect decision making. And we're really pretty heartened to see that rather than all the decisions being made or, on a medicines basis, what's potentially inappropriate um, from, a, from a medical perspective, that in about at least a fifth of cases that patient goals and priorities were reflected in the decisions that, that, were come, um, that were made in the final plan. And we found that the, the medicines numbers and the direction of effect of most of the measures we um, had tested was in the direction that we'd hoped for. And this is a, an example of how these kinds of things mapped to the goals. So you can see that the, the functional goals are the left of a, of a couple of, um, of exemplar patients. And you can see the medication change um, made um, and the reason for making that on the right. Um, this is what happened with our outcomes. So you can see the green outcome measures all um, trended um, to moving in the direction that we might hope for to try and, and reduce the, the harmful effects. Some we saw nothing in, in and in a couple, they seem to move in the opposite direction to that which we hypothesized. Whether that's real or whether that's just kind of um, a, a, a random error, we will see in the main trial. So that'll be interesting. Grip strength, we found that we were measuring it incorrectly. So that was a, a, um, a good clue. We weren't... Um, uh, taking account of sex in our analysis. And 
from patients' pers uh, um, perspective, this is what some of those um, changes meant. So in, in the first patient that we trialled in the feasibility study, she went from not being able to give her own informed consent, her daughter had to do it for her, to having a marked cognitive improvement that, it, that meant that she was completely able to make her own decisions after two weeks. We found one um, case of serotonin syndrome, which is one of those syndromes where it's a, it's a, a cumulative additive effect of side effects of, of a number of drugs. And this hadn't been recognised. It was just um, attributed to, to sort of age and confusion, agitated and falls, and that completely resolved within a few weeks. And, and the same, another patient who'd been feeling dizzy and, and unsteady and it started to fall um, once their blood pressure treatment was reduced, um, that went completely. So meaningful things from patients. And so that was quite heartening to us. So just to finish up to let you know where we are now, um, we're in the middle of a of a larger randomized controlled trial because these these feasibility outcomes gave us enough um, confidence that we could move forward with a, a larger trial. We're doing this in collaboration with a number of groups, including um, J uh, James's and, and he will, I won't steal his thunder, he'll tell you more about uh, the work that they've been doing in the feasibility study and, and then in the study. Um, we are two thirds of the way through recruitment. We had to halt unfortunately because of COVID, but now we've moved to virtual, uh, virtual ways of doing this. Our other trials, which were at the feasibility study stage have had to be paused because they're in higher risk settings that require contact. It's being trialed in Australia in three settings as well, different settings. Um, and the American Society of Consultant Pharmacists are also looking to, to implement it as a tool. So that'll be really interesting to see how that goes. So um, really, um, it'll be interesting to see um, whether these bright this bright idea pans out in, in the real world. Um, and, and what I really wanted to highlight is, from my perspective, this is a very complex and complicated problem and, and it doesn't have an easy or concrete answer. The more we do, the more cracks and paradoxes that we find in our understanding of this phenomenon. But these are real gifts because as Leonard Cohen says, there is a crack in everything and it's how the light gets in. So thank you for your, your time and attention. And, and I'm now going to stop sharing and um, hand over to James to give a, a different perspective on this issue. Great, thanks. Thanks, thanks, Dee. I, um, I almost wanna just have you continue to talk about it because <laughs> it's so fascinating and I, I feel like um, I feel very grateful that um, I've been able to and our group has been able to kind of participate in this large project so I see what you've articulated as being this really interesting um, uh, enterprise to try to think about how to come up with a, a means by which to help folks who are older who are on many medications to um, you know reduce those medications if they make sense and uh, and so I feel like our our piece is a small piece within that that larger larger project and um, I, I have really enjoyed being involved in it so far and and really look forward to continuing to be involved in because it's really really interesting and and the um, you know, with the theme of this talk around bringing different perspectives together, I mean, I think it's been a really interesting kind of collaboration because we we do come to this question from different, I think, complementary approaches. And so my interest in it was to, um, was not, almost not to, not to see the older adult who's on many many medications as a patient, but to see them more as a as a person who is sort of living their lives with medications, and to try to understand more the experience of what that's like uh, for someone who is older who has many medications who might be thinking about how to uh, use this process to um, you know reassess you know the, the the treatment protocol they've been on many many in many cases for a long time, like you mentioned with legacy drugs. And, and so the approach that we took, um, you know, was a, was a fairly conventional kind of qualitative analysis. And uh, it makes me kind of pine for a pre-COVID moment because this all took place kind of pre-COVID, what I'm speaking about. And so it feels like such a long time ago. Um, uh, and what we, were, what we were interested in really is the significance of medications 
for older adults who were using, you know, many, many medications at the same time. This, this, this notion of polypharmacy. And, and what, what we meant by significance was, you know, if you take the word significance and you kind of break it up, I mean, it's, it's both kind of the meanings of medications for people. So they signify something to people, but it also is, is beyond just meanings, but it also speaks to a kind of relevance or a kind of importance to them as well. Something that kind of stands out. And, and the, the kind of point of taking this perspective around understanding the significance of something like medications to people is, is really to tease out the paradoxes and the contradictions and the complexity of it. And so I thought this title for this talk was very appropriate because when we you know, spoke to older adults about their, their use of medications and the significance of them, you know, it, it often was contradictory and paradoxical. And, and so it was really fascinating to have the opportunity to delve more into those paradoxes and those contradictions, not to try to explain them or to solve them for people, but, but simply to try to understand the complexity of them and, and to perhaps think about ways in which Taper um, might be able to help them uh, you know, live with some of those paradoxes or make sense of some of those paradoxes. So that was um, uh, really the, the approach that we took our team in terms of speaking to um, people who were uh, thinking about and, and participating in um, this, this taper exercise. And, and one of the, and, and, and so I want, you know, there were a number of paradoxes, but the one I want to delve into, into a little bit more detail is one that I, I particularly like, and it speaks to this, um, this notion of trust. And, and, and what we found really interesting was that when people were struggling with the decision around which to taper their medications, they relied just as much on their friends as they did their, their healthcare professionals. So they re relied on what we would consider to be anecdotal um, information almost as much as they would what we would consider expert information. And, and that seemed a, a little paradoxical um, in terms of making decisions about your medications. And so we wanted to ask the question, which is often asked in qualitative research is why? Like, why would you, um, uh, uh, you know, rely sometimes as much on someone who knows nothing about medications as you would someone who has dedicated their whole career to understanding how medications work. Um, and, and so that was a really interesting question for us. And, and it led us to think about uh, the nature of, of trust and the significance of medications for people. And, and one of the things that came out of the interviews was that people um, uh, re relied on, on what we found to be sort of two different forms of trust. And one stemmed from uh, a kind of a reliance on the experiences and advice of friends in their kind of social network. And then there was another form of trust that seemed to stem and rely more on the expertise of their healthcare providers. Um, and so they would seek out, you know, information from both of those two groups and, and the nature of the the sense of security that they got from being able to make a decision about tapering their medications was different um, uh, across those two different groups. And it, and, and it, it led us to think more about um, the, you know, what we think of when we think of trust. And uh, in the literature, in sociology, uh, there's a, a fair bit written about, about trust. And uh, we, we relied on this um, writings of a, of a German sociologist, uh, 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 Jürgen Habermas, who, who talks about people's lives being kind of divided up into two different, um, two different worlds, is really what he calls them. And one is, um, is called the life world, and the other one is called the system world. And so if you think of it in the, these terms, the kind of relationship that you have with friends or with family are, are situated in what he called a, a life world. And really it's just this, this, this everyday life that we have. And the kinds of relationships we have are non-instrumental relationships. You know, you, you are with these people and you hang out with these people and you talk with these people, not because 
um, you have to, or because you want to get something out of them, or if it's part of a, a, a business relationship or, or, or there's a kind of a, a, a reason for you to do it, you're doing it simply because you like to hang out with this other person and they're part of your life. And, and friends uh, really, really provided that sense of, of security that emerges out of this kind of life world. And, and so that was one important piece around this notion of trust. But then there was another one, and that was um, what he called a system world. And, um, and, and these are relationships where you're, you're interacting with someone, but more because it's an instrumental relationship. It, there's a, a kind of a means to an end. So if you buy something from Starbucks, or if you have to go see your physician, or it's a specialist, you're, you're interacting with that person, not because you're buddies or because you're best friends or because you like hanging out with each other you you may like each other you may not like each other but you're there because there's a, a system relationship that you are um uh interacting with at that time and there's a certain kind of uh um, nature to that kind of relationship and and so when people were making decisions around you know to, to, to taper their medications, which was a really serious and in some ways um, uh, risk-filled decision, they people sought out uh, security from both the, the system world and, and this life world. And so it was important for them to be able to feel secure that their friends and families supported this decision on a life world level. And it was important that their healthcare professional also supported them in this decision uh, from a, a more system world uh, perspective. And, and, you know, I think, I think um, you know, that is something that you might expect. Um, but what was interesting was that we found that it was people felt more secure in making decisions around changing their medications and changing the way they were living their life if they had both at the same time. And so if you're able to kind of bolster someone by, by attending to both uh, the, the, the trust that they got from their decisions around the medications from a life world level and, and also a system world level, that, that uh, uh, created an environment in, in which they felt fully supported around making decisions across those two different levels. And so it was, it was too difficult for someone to just have uh, a, a sense of support from their family and not their healthcare provider, or from just their healthcare provider and not their family. They, they really needed both, that the both, both were uh, 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 um, um, stitched together in terms of the, the the life of the of the the person who was making these decisions and so it was a really interesting um kind of finding i guess for lack of a better word that came out of these interviews with people and looking at the kinds of relationships that they uh used to uh, make sense of this decision that they were going to make and how this uh, decision lined up with um how secure they felt uh, around doing that. Um, and so there's a number of, of lessons, I think, to be learned from this. Um, and, and one that I think, I think informs, um, you know, the way in which an intervention like taper could be successful. And one, I think, just on a very, very broad level, is that, um, is that our lives in general within this moment in history, and it might even be worse now um, with COVID, I'm not, I'm not sure, is, uh, is becoming much more oriented towards system relationships. So we, we have um, more and more system world interactions with people and, and fewer and fewer life world interactions with people that, that the life world um, in a kind of late modern moment um, is is decreasing, and and that's part of, you know, this notion of why uh, loneliness uh, is such a problem uh, now is that, um, you know, there are fewer and fewer opportunities for people to have meaningful interactions with others just just because they like to be with that other person. Um, the, the the system world is is 
permeating more and more of our interactions. Um, but this, this loss of life world is even more intense for older adults. You know, you know when you're uh, older and, um, and uh, it's often harder for you to uh, have a group of people who support you in that uh, life world uh, way. I remember, in, you know, one really memorable interview that I had with one woman who was uh, going through this, and she had been living in a long-term care center, uh, taking care of her husband for, who who recently had passed away uh, from Alzheimer's, and she had no one. Like she was now alone. Uh, she didn't have any family left. She didn't have any friends left. She was situated entirely in a system world um, relationship with others. And so when her physician said, you know, you should really bring someone to uh, the appointment, she, she didn't have anyone to bring to the, the appointment. And so I think, I think the situation of, of, um, of being older can sometimes isolate folks and, and that loss of a life world can be exacerbated. Um, and so I think, I think, you know, when we think about tapering, I think it can be enhanced if older adults can find forms of trust along these two axes. And one, one possible way of doing that, I think, is to, is to think about where sort of peer support or, or peer support around people's interactions with medications to, you know, so that uh, older adults can reach out to others, other older adults who, um, you know, may have an, a direct experience with something like tapering um, of their medications, but they're not a healthcare professional, um, and so they're they they can have more of a life world relationship with these folks, um, whereas when they interact simply with their physician or with the healthcare provider, um, it's really hard to break out of that system world relationship. Um, also from that is, um, you know, being aware of the context of people's lives. And so having an awareness from a healthcare provider point of view that, that there is this almost kind of trust assessment that can be done to, to see where someone is situated in terms of, you know, are, 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 you know, do they really rely on a kind of life world for making decisions or, or, or do they rely more on a kind of system world to make these decisions? And, and, and what is almost kind of like the balance for each person in terms of what they emphasize, recognizing that they, 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 they need both in some, some level, that that I think could help guide um, uh, 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 decisions that al allow people to sustain a sense of security as they move through this process. The other lesson I think that's valuable is, is uh, to encourage healthcare providers to think about bringing aspects of the life world into their interactions uh, with patients. So, you know, I don't think it's, you know, we talk about patient-centered care and I, and I don't think it's possible for, for a healthcare provider to um, uh, completely no longer think of their patient as a patient, but I think there are ways in which they can introduce um, uh, and, and open up the life world into that relationship. Uh, it, so it's more of a, a balance so that, so that there can be more of a life world within that system world relationship, um, whether that is talking about themselves uh, or talking about the patient, not as a patient, but just as another person. Um, outside of that context of them being being a patient, um, and so I'll I'll stop I'll stop there because I know that um, we wanted to leave some time for some discussion and some questions, um, and uh, I, I wanted to just give a a little glimpse into some of the work that that we're doing and um, and and some of the insights that's come out of doing doing these interviews, so I will. Um, I guess pass it to you, Giselle. Is that right? Jazine, yeah. Thank you. Jazine, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, James and D. Um, so I have a, a lot of questions that I want to ask, but um, so because you didn't have a slide, and I'm a visual learner. I, so you, James, you spoke about the system world and the life world. Yeah. Life world. Life world. Okay. Just think I'm of just, it as like 
families and friends versus professionals. Okay. Um, so I'm a family member that goes to doctor's appointments with my, with my aging parents. And so I've seen the difference. I mean, so what, like what tapering is about is really dealing with drugs once the horse has left the barn, so to speak. I've, um, I've seen, you know, one parent uh, asked to control their diabetes or their pre-diabetes levels by making lifestyle changes and the other simply offered the medication. Um, and so I'm coming into this thinking more about, I know more about prescription drug non-compliance costs to the medical system than I've ever heard about tapering um, as a consumer. So I know a little about, about tapering because I've, I've been a McMaster and I'm familiar with, with these work now, um, but it, it's hard, I think, for a family member to understand about tapering without having a, a, a proper frame of reference. So. Often I will hear, uh, I will hear, well, if you don't take this medication, you're going to have another stroke rather than um, these are the side effects uh, or this is the percentage that this might change your, your chances. So how, how do we get the people, um, is it the life system? <laughs> the family members, life how world. do we get them on board with understanding the advantages of tapering? I mean, I, don't, I can I can feel this. T, I don't know if you want to um, jump in as well. I mean, I think I think I think one of the challenges, and I'm I'm actually just just I don't I, I'm just guessing from our research based on on that scenario that you meant is that sometimes you know the family member needs somebody who's not an expert like they need their family member to not be an expert <laughs> or or to be a little bit of an expert and so you know i think problems can arise sometimes where the family member sort of tries to be also the healthcare provider at the same time and so there's like no again there's no space for the life world in that relationship you know the the older adult might need their family member to actually say you know what i think that physician's crazy <laughs> you know because it it validates some of the experiences that they might be feeling but if the family member you know uh, treats themselves like a surrogate healthcare professional like outside of the context of that that relationship, you know, I, I could see how an older adult might feel a little ganged up on in terms of trying to make these decisions where they they want to feel supported both by their family and their and their um, their physician. And often I think it, 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 you know, and again, I'll look to you Dee, for more advice. I mean, I'm not sure that the people I interviewed, it's not like they didn't understand it, like they understood it. And so having someone else tell them what they should do didn't help, you know, like, it's sort of like, it's like someone who's smoking, you know, you keep telling, you know, having another family member tell them to stop smoking doesn't, you know, over, over the long term can help them stop, but it's not that they don't know that it's bad for them. Um, it's just more complicated than that, more complex than that. And so what I, what we found was that, you know, I guess another way to say it is that people needed different kinds of support from the people who are around them when they were making these kinds of decisions. They, they didn't just need healthcare advice. They needed, they needed other kinds of support. Hmm. I, I would agree with that. I think family members work best as a, as a reflection space for the person's own thoughts and, and to offer support if, if they choose to go through the process to, you know, to um, offer support and if they're having, um, um, withdrawal effects or you know that, that sort of instrumental support as well particularly with stopping things like antidepressants it's really important to have that kind of um, support and um, and I, I agree with you that that it's not helpful for anyone to have someone tell them to what to do but you know when they already already know it's really the the nuances of the decision making that's that's the issue you know it's it's of no help for me to tell someone to stop smoking everybody knows that smoking is bad for you and it, it's just tedious boring and paternalistic for me to you know to to tell patients of mine who smoke that they should stop smoking because it's bad for them so uh, i agree that concrete approach um um doesn't work and what's helpful i mean i think for some families um um, this this narrative of that's in the media that we are responsible that science is miracle breakthrough cure 
has been taken up by the community and it needs more of a community discussion to understand that there are actually a bunch of different narratives around treatments. And families have often responded to this and, and see a marker of care that their role is to encourage the person to take and stay on their treatments. Um, and that becomes that we see also in long-term care where, where families perhaps live far away or don't, um, don't have much contact with their, um, their loved one. Um, you know, they, they see, and often out of guilt, they advocate for the person to have as much volume of treatment as, as sort of a metaphor for, for caring. Um, which is interesting. Somebody commented in the chat, there's a question about um, uh, the time pressure on clinicians at the moment that really limits the ability to, to have conversation. A conversation is, relationship and conversation is the essence of, of good family medicine. And the, the, the external demands uh, um, that, are, that try and um, make um, family medicine and care into some sort of algorithmic production line, um, chip away at the ability to, to have that space for conversation. The, the beauty of, of family medicine is that it's a relationship over time. So you, and certainly, you know, before TAPE, when I would have these conversations with patients, I would sort of raise the issue in, in one conversation and then come back to it in another. And then, you know, you need, you need that time for reflection and conversation. So I think spreading it over time, but some of the things we've tried to do with the pathway have tried to reduce the amount of time spent in looking at the sort of instrumental concrete things um, and, and to try and maximize the time for that, the, that conversation. So sort of pulling all those tools together so nobody has to think about it really beforehand and trying to unload some of the um, family physician time, which is about the relationship and the, and the reflection um, by, by the pharmacist really using their expertise just to make those initial, do that first review and to have the patient have their reflection before they, they come as well. But I agree with it's um, Alison that raised that point that, you know, that the, the invention of the EMR has been, um, you know, a poison chalice, the electronic medical record, because it demands our time and attention rather than focusing a gaze on, on the patient. The, the kinds of reimbursement systems that exist in, in um, Canada are really counterproductive to, to this kind of care. You know, that there is no, you really um, ought to be able to take longer than a standard consultation length for this, but there's no mechanism to fund that time. So essentially, if a practitioner takes um, a longer time to do this work, they're they are paying for it themselves. So there are all, at all kinds of levels that are, there are things that might facilitate this better. Okay, that's, that's good. Um, James, do you want to address the other part of Allison's question, maybe helping patients cut to the chase? How do we help people to ask good questions about the medicines they're on? I mean, we, uh, yeah, I, ha I haven't, I mean, Dee and I haven't really talked about this very much, but, um, you know, I, I, I do think that there might be a role for, you know, and, and I think eventually when, when taper has more, has been used more, I think it would be interesting to, to have people who have gone through that process, just talk about their experiences of it so that, so that, so that people who are considering doing it can rely on, on, on the experiences of others to, to know what questions work or what question doesn't work. Or, I mean, I think, I think that really is, I think that that kind of knowledge is really developed out of experiences of people. And if, if we can make the experiences of people who say have successfully tapered available to people who are thinking about doing it, that could be a really valuable source of information for them to know what questions to ask or what questions not to ask given their situation. So, I mean, I'm a, I'm a big proponent of trying to find ways for people to connect a, across common experiences and share knowledge uh, with one another across those experiences. So they find that, that there are fewer and fewer opportunities for, for folks to do that. And I guess in the past we used to call them support groups. And support groups have kind of like a, I don't know if it's a stigma associated with them, but this idea that somehow you need support, but they're more just like sharing knowledge groups. Um, you know, it's like crowdsourcing among people going through similar kinds of experiences. Is there a role for public health? I know that in some hospitals I saw advertising explaining that you might not need to do a course of antibiotics for X, Y, or Z, and or maybe you don't need this extra diagnostic test. Is there, a, is there a role for making, making that, having, raising some